going. Uh, the live stream is also on. A very warm welcome to all our viewers this evening, those who are joining us through Zoom directly, and also for those who of you who are joining us through uh, Facebook Live. My name is Tarun Amrasekar, and welcome to the second episode of Goodnight Colombo, where we talk on the, on the topics and the subject matter that truly matters. And today, as a special guest, I am in rich privilege to welcome a very good friend of mine, a dear brother of mine, to be honest, uh, Jehan Mubarak. Jehan, welcome to Goodnight Colombo. Thank you, Tarino. Uh, thank you for having me, and good night to uh, everyone here. And uh, usually, we all see Jehan. We, we, we used to see him as a, a cricketer on the field, and then we see him on uh, sports channels, give, doing his commentaries, giving his thoughts on uh, cricket. Uh, most comments and thoughts about with which I usually uh, don't agree, and he has made a strict policy decision never to talk about cricket with me ever uh, on a public forum or. On, on, on a personal basis. So when I contacted him regarding this program, his first comment was that if it's about cricket, I'm not going to talk with you because there, there are, we will definitely, when it comes to certain players and decisions, we will never ever agree. And, uh, but that is exactly why today we have Jahan speaking on a topic that uh, many of you may not really know that he is passionate about and that is to, uh, that is mainly on helping those who have been affected by gender-based violence and especially the victims of child abuse. It's an area that Jehan is very passionately working with. And whoever that knows Jehan very closely will know that he will always try to get your assistance as well and help them out. And it is indeed a worthy cause, a grave matter about which not too much is spoken about because, for, I mean, unfortunately, especially some people, some high-level decision makers tend to think that in a cultured society, in a cultured country, that this topic should not be spoken about and that uh, it is a taboo topic not to be really discussed in public. But this is indeed a topic that I believe personally that we should talk about. Just to tell you about my experience on this matter, about the perception of people. When I shared the flyer for today's episode, I had a few people talking to me and commenting me and saying, why is it that two men are talking about this topic? Uh, you should have a woman also involved. You should have a lady involved in the panel to speak about this. And it should not be two men speaking about it. Well, I personally think in my view that enough men are not really talking about this matter. And uh, that uh, it tends to be always looked upon as a topic that only women are speaking about. So today we have Jehan Mubarak joining us to speak on a on that topic, gender-based violence and sexual abuse victims in Sri Lanka, they are like, what can we do as a society and where things are really going wrong? But before that, Jehan, I have a question for you. This is related to cricket, but not really on cricket, cricket. What does a cricket coach do during a lockdown? I mean, are you training the boys through uh, Zoom? These days, uh, Jehan's prominent role is as uh, the cricket coach for the Royal College cricket team. The big match just managed to escape the lockdown. Uh, but Jehan, what's, are you having any Zoom training sessions? Yeah, I mean, everything is now virtual. So everyone's getting used to working from home. Um, and just to keep the boys in a routine, we have uh, fitness sessions every morning. Uh, we have broken it up into two groups. Uh, 6.30 every morning. Uh, the first week, I also was wondering if it was a good idea because I had to kick myself out of bed. But once uh, we got used to waking up early, everyone's there on time. Uh, and it's good, but we can't do a lot. But it's just to make sure that while we're keeping the physical uh, part of it, keeping ourselves physically active, but also to make sure that our mental state is good, that we are energetic, that we are positive, looking forward to uh, things, whether it's in cricket or in uh, things that we do in our daily life, uh, just to have a positive outlook in what is otherwise uh, some can be a depressing situation. Are we to expect a Royal Thomian one-day encounter over a computer game? <laughs> uh, that will be tough to say. It's, uh, I, that's really difficult to say when sports is going to restart and especially school sports. And we all know that the Royal Thomian, we copped a bit of flack for continuing uh, with the Royal Thomian when some of the other games were locked down. So I think people will be a bit more mindful before uh, going back into fully fledged uh, sports, even if they do. I don't think you'll be able to, you'll be allowed to come and watch it. It'll probably be behind the closed doors uh, till uh, things settle down. Right. Jahan, as a, as a coach, I mean, what's your philosophy towards coaching your 
team. You have shared some thoughts with us earlier as well. But especially when you took over, you took over a young team, a team uh, that really needed some guidance as well. What's your coaching philosophy? The coaching philosophy is to, my coaching philosophy, wherever I coach, is to help the players be the best they can be. And that will change the point, like, and it may not fit into my timelines of one year or two years. He may be the best he can be in five years. He may be the best he can be in six months. Uh, but it, I, I spend, I need to spend time with them to understand uh, what their potential is. And also, it's more about them discovering themselves. Uh, I don't want players to go about saying, I batted the way I was told to bat, or I bowled the way I was told to bat. I want them to go out there and express themselves and go out there and say, I batted the way I wanted to bat. And for that to fit in with the team game plan and our own, my coaching philosophy and their coaching philosophy. Excellent. So, let's talk about uh, your role at Emerge Lanka because from the time I remember you've been involved with them and it's a topic you have always passionately spoken about and recently, and congratulations on your appointment to the board of Emerge Lanka. What does Emerge Lanka exactly do? So the Emerge Lanka Foundation uh, works with uh, childhood survivors of sexual abuse. So these are young girls who have been uh, sexually abused and put in uh, protective custody, protective shelters uh, for the duration of their court case. And uh, during that period, Emerge works uh, within those shelters, um, helping them, uh, helping the girls get through a very, very difficult part of their lives, uh, helping them get back on their feet with uh, life skills activities, education, uh, and then also with a post-shelter uh, reintegration, once they do come out of uh, protective custody, once their court cases are over, uh, to help them get back into society, to reintegrate, uh, to feel confident about themselves, and also to feel that uh, they are a part of society and that they are a valuable part of society, and they, that they are valued wherever they go. And that entire transformation from after the incident of abuse or whatever took place, which is really, really traumatic, which is it's difficult for us to understand. And that is one of the issues I think that um, a lot of people have, which you mentioned, why are there two men talking about uh, women's issues, is that I don't think we can properly comprehend uh, what goes on. But we, what we can do, as you said, is that we can help them get back their lives, their livelihoods, and you know, go on and uh, be successful people in our society. All right. Uh, Jahan, let's, uh, this topic of gender-based violence. Now, it's a very broad topic and different people have different definitions for it. Some people say it's only in a case of, let's say, physical violence or sexual uh, assault that it's a case of a gender-based violence. And some people will say no, any kind of, uh, let's say, intimidation, gender-based uh, intimidation and discrimination can fall under that. What's your take on this? There are, I mean, various uh, definitions. My definition is if you have, this is my definition of violence. And I just, I just want to lay out something when I talk about gender-based violence. This is my opinion on how we should look at anything. When we say gender-based, when we uh, draw a line, either based on gender, on race, on age, on nationality, on religion, um, we say we kind of put them apart and say, okay, this is their problem, this is not our problem. So, with, with the, anything gender based or any based violence, it's making someone feel uncomfortable. So, if you have done anything which knowingly or unknowingly, most of the time it's unknowingly, sometimes it's knowingly, just harassment, most of the time we don't even know we're doing it. But if you have made someone feel uncomfortable, I think you have committed some sort of infringement. And then it is your responsibility as a citizen, as a human being, to find out why you have made another person uncomfortable. Now, it's a lot easier for us to do that as men. We can talk to someone else if you have upset them, ask them why we have you know, offended them. Uh, but with women, that is not often the case. Um, we do it often without knowing it. And uh, often without acknowledging it even afterwards. 
it's become a part of uh, our lives and our cultures but because of that mindset that we have that we have kind of normalized this harassment or violence or whatever where in society we have the men it's a patriarchal society where we have men at least perceived to be slightly at a higher uh, acceptance than women and with that stems this uh, feeling of authority that you can subjugate another person whether it is based on gender or any other lines and it is it's where all that stems from so a lot of the young girls uh, who are abused most of the time it's by people whom they are very close to either their family immediate family members or it's someone they know really well a guardian a cousin and uncle it someone they really really know well and someone they trust and that's where this whole thing comes down it's someone they trust and people trust when you have a friend whether it's a man or a girl or a boy uh, when you trust someone to do something right by you and you don't that breach of trust and that invasion is that is my, what drew me towards this cause because i feel that we have let down um, a large population of our society whether it's women or whether it's children and unfortunately the problem is so big and emerge can only work with a small uh, portion of it so for me that is what it is that we've let down uh, these girls and that we owe it to them to get back on their feet jahan is this is this a problem that you see mainly concentrated in areas of population that let's say has lesser education lower income levels or is this rampantly spread across uh, the country i think it's ramp it's difficult to say i mean it's like this not every case is reported we all know a lot of stats that we get has to do with reporting as you can see with the the covid testing uh, it's your data is as good as your testing so if we Uh, get reports of every case of abuse that is committed i'm sure the numbers will be much higher and it will give us a better idea of the breakdown colombo outside colombo rural affluent but that is not the case people even women in the rural areas <coughs> excuse me the the culture is such that they are very accepting of what has taken place and they are not in a financial position to be able to take up this in court over a period of 3 or 4 years and they don't report it and uh, they just try to normalize it and uh, get on with their lives so it's not something that um, affects a certain part population i think it's universal and it's something that we need to look uh, on a national level even <coughs> now if you look at the system that is in place now as i have been informed and through what i have seen there is a system for example if a girl if, if a young girl let's say a girl who is below 18 years old faces some kind of a sexual assault or a abuse there is a system where the government takes them in they are kept in a witness protection etc now yes some system is always better than no system but having said that the system itself has so many flaws in it uh, what would you like to just share that system with us that is currently in place so th- with all systems the systems are always ev- evolving changing with the times and with the problems uh, and this is one yeah, can that- i interrupt you there i like to interrupt you there uh, would you say that the problem is evolving faster than the system yeah this i was just going to say this is one system that has taken a long time to evolve um and again because there is not enough uh pressure like there's we don't talk about it enough there's no reason there's no lobbying there's no pressure on uh policy makers to effect change uh, but i mean slowly i think that is coming with social media and more people coming out and talking about it uh, putting pressure to bring in those changes that are needed at uh, in the system but the system it's the system works where someone reports a case of abuse at a police station <coughs> especially for a underage girl or boy for that matter they are taken into a uh, protective custody then they do the tests that are required but for all this you need trained people from the time they 
incident is reported, you need someone who is understanding. Uh, you need a female police officer to take down the report, to speak to the child. You need someone to administer uh, the test kit. There is a rape test kit. It has to be someone sensitive who does it, to someone who does it. Then into court, so every step of the way, someone needs to be mindful of this fact that we are dealing with young girls. And that they are, every step is, a, is traumatic for them. It's not that the uh, abuse happened and that it ended up there. Every step of the way, they have to repeat it, relive it. And it's traumatic for them. These are young girls that we're talking about. And I can only imagine what it feels like because I have a daughter. And of course, I, I think that fathers are drawn more to this cause uh, more than, until you, I, I, I could be wrong here, but when you have a daughter, uh, it changes your perspective uh, of how you look at uh, things. And, and now you, everyone has a mother, everyone has a sister, a wife, and you see them as an in, intrinsic part of society. Uh, and it just changes the whole way you look at things. So Jahan, uh, coming back to the process. So right now when a case gets reported, yes, uh, th let's talk about this witness protection. I believe there are also so many other parties involved in this uh, mm -hmm. Witness protection. Uh, we, we are going to definitely come back to emerge and the role emerge plays and all that. But just to identify, uh, you know, the what they go through. So once they are taken into the witness protection, there are certain some of these centers. I believe are run by the missionaries and all where they, these girls are kept and they are given the chance to uh, at least till the court case is over to stay. Uh, well, most of the shelters are run uh, are by the state department, by the probation department. And also very closely, they work with the NCPA, the National Child Protection Authority. Uh, and the police also have a separate force for uh, women and children. So the three, um, they do work and work in sync together, but the timelines are very long. The, the time from when an incident is reported to when it's uh, taken up in court, it's long. Um, and every day in court, the child has to relive uh, the story. I mean, you, you know how court cases work. You go to court, uh, you tell the story to one judge, uh, then you're cross-examined by law. It's the same. It's, it's not different to any other case. And it is always in a public hearing. So recently, there have been a lot of lobbying to change this process because uh, you don't want the girl to be talking about it. The identity of the girl is important. Uh, you want to keep it as confidential as possible. But in a public hearing, She's going to be embarrassed. Everyone's going to be embarrassed. She's, and you might forget. Um, and it's all, the entire onus is on a young girl to prove this case. And often she doesn't have a good representation. Uh, whereas the offender often gets away. And we always hear about cases of uh, the victim. But very rarely do we hear about uh, cases of the offender. And I think... One thing that we really can do, which I would really like to push for, is to have a list of uh, convicted uh, offenders, which is public uh, information in most countries. If you have been convicted of abuse, any kind of abuse, um, and in our case, convicted of child abuse, you should be on a list and you should, be not, you should not be allowed anywhere near a child. You should not be allowed in uh, education, in uh, childcare. So those kind of things really need to come in uh, to our system. Is uh, Sri Lanka to a certain extent being uh, seen as a safe haven for these child uh, abusers and uh, these, these convicts? Because even today we saw there was a notice by the FBI about a Sri Lankan who had been, uh, who is accused of raping a six-year-old girl who they believe has now escaped uh, USA and has come back to Sri Lanka and you know operating freely here. But do we, do you know, do you tend to see such a reputation, unfortunately, being developed for Sri Lanka as a destination for this kind of this child prostitution and uh, child abuse? I don't think Sri Lanka, especially, uh, I would single Sri Lanka out uh, on its own. Uh, but this problem is not unique to Sri Lanka. Uh, it's unique to the region, if you want, to Asia, to India, Thailand, um, Vietnam. There are... There's a lot of trafficking, trafficking that goes on. Uh, child trafficking, even in the US, there's child trafficking. Uh, China has a lot of child trafficking. And it's, it's not a problem that's uh, unique to Sri Lanka. And people will always find a way of getting out of one place. And uh, 
maybe setting up an operation somewhere else. So someone in the US comes over to Sri Lanka, uh, sets up here. And we don't have a list, a database of how we can track them uh, and report them. Even if we do know who they are, we have no way of tracing them. Jan, I want to draw the attention to a very important point you raised that uh, in most cases, the, the, the one who does the abuse, the, the criminal, I would call it, is actually known to the victim, is yeah. in some way known or connected or a trusted party. We'll take the, probably the most uh, dire situation where a young girl is actually abused or raped by the father. And the court case is going on. What, what about the rest of the family members? Do they openly come out and support this daughter? Or what, what kind of approach do most mothers take in, in the way that you've seen so far? So that's it. It's almost like the victim is treat, treated as the offender. Um, for speaking out. It, it's for speaking out. If there's a stigma associated with it. Uh, and especially, which happens most of the time, is that um, there is uh, a pregnancy that results from the abuse and there is a child. So once a young girl has a child, the family sometimes do reject her. They may not take her back. And sh she really is uh, very much on her own. And because it, I think it's because of the situation that people are in, uh, that they don't, don't want to upset the apple cart. Uh, the father or the uncle or the husband is probably the breadwinner in the family. Um, if he is locked up in jail, there's no way of uh, earning any money and they probably have more children in the house. There are about four or five uh, children in the house. So they, you know, try to get over it and forget about it uh, and get on with their lives and try to normalize uh, the abuse. Jahan, now, Let's say in, 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 a, in a case like this where the girl, the, the girl has actually, the, the, course, the court case is over and let's say, yes, they do find the offender as guilty or let's say not guilty. And now this girl is actually unable to go back home because some, sometimes, as you said, the village might be rejecting her, maybe the family is rejecting her. What's her plight? Where to from there? Well, that's where we want to uh, emerge is trying to say we've uh, piloted a reintegration center. So if the girl I'm, is, asking, I'm asking prior to that, prior to that, what was their fate? So does the government okay. at some point, does the government say, okay, look, you know what, now the case is over. You have to go from this uh, center. Is that what the government says? Or? Uh, well, technically they are in custody only until their court cases are over. Uh, or until they turn 18. So once they turn 18, uh, the state doesn't have uh, guardianship over them. Uh, there are uh, programs where they try to link them up with vocational training programs, uh, life skills programs uh, to help them get back uh, on their feet. But it's uh, it's not structured. It's um, not monitored. So the government's, the state's responsibility kind of ends with the court case and with the shelter programs. So once, especially once a girl turns 18, she's pretty much on her own. All right. So, uh, and for the information of our viewers who are joining us this evening, I must say that when I say government, we are not referring to the current government or previous government per se. This has been a problem that successive governments over the years have actually ignored to a large extent. Yes, there are policies, there are committees, yes. They are doing something, but in my view, from what I've seen, and I don't know if the Jihan will agree with me on this or not, but what they do is hardly enough for uh, the, the given situation of the problem. Jihan, I uh, want to know the role of Emerge. So as you said, once they've turned 18, you know, they're on their own. But they are, no one is really there to take responsibility. I want to ask, okay, how, where, how does Emerge really step in? Let's talk about this reintegration center a little bit more. So the reintegration is for those girls who are over 18 um, to do exactly what we are. They don't have a means of uh, going back to their family, finding a job. And they are coming from a very fragile uh, background, from a fragile mental state. So to help them regain that confidence. And the thing is, this time, a lot of these girls are actually very smart. Um, they, and this could happen to any one of us. This is not something that happens to uh, 
the less affluent, the people who don't have uh, the means, it happens to, you know, people who have everything sometimes. So it, it doesn't uh, discriminate uh, as much as uh, humans do. Uh, abuse doesn't discriminate. Uh, and so these girls are smart, um, but unfortunately they have not been able to do their O levels because they've been in protective custody. Um, sometimes they do sit for their O levels while uh, they're in the shelter, but it's a really difficult uh, way to do that. Um, but what we try to do is give them some education, uh, basic education, some IT training, some self-defense, uh, counseling support, uh, and try to find something that they're good at. Let them find something that they're good at and try and link them up uh, with uh, a workplace, a safe, uh, secure workplace. And most so far, we have a lot of success stories from our reintegration program. A lot of the girls uh, have found uh, stable jobs. Uh, some have actually settled down, married, have started families of their own, which is really, really good to hear. Um, and they, and those are the ambassadors, the real ambassadors, not not me sitting here talking, but the real ambassadors are the survivors who come back out and advocate um, and spread the word uh, and, you know, encourage more people to take a stand against this. Jahan, let's talk about the, the mindset of a victim, especially a one, let's say, okay, the court case is over. So, Basically, regardless of in which way the decision at the court case actually goes, and uh, they've lived through that, they've, they're made to live through that trauma again and again, and some of them are finding uh, their, uh, I mean, their life situation getting even more worse because now the court case is over, they're 18 and they just have to go and find, here is Emerge, happy to help them, and they come into the reintegration center. What is their mindset like? Are they still hopeful about the future or are they in a more of a shutdown kind of a mindset? What are they really, in, in terms of their mindset, what have you seen? Okay, this is one area where I'm uh, not very qualified to give an opinion on uh, because the mindset from, is... Totally from your experience, not from a, not from a yes. psychological viewpoint at all. Just from, I'll, I can, I'll tell you, I'll just to give a bit of background, I'll tell you what I felt like when I first... Uh, met these girls or when I saw them, but honestly, I didn't know where to look. Uh, I've been into a few of a uh, few shelters and even at the reintegration center, even when I meet some of these girls outside, uh, I don't know whether to look at them directly because I feel that they would be offended by all men, whether they see me as a threat or whether I remind them of something of their horrible past. Jahan, or, I remember one, Jahan, I remember once you said that Sometimes you may be wearing uh, a shirt or a t-shirt that has the same color of the clothing that the offender was wearing and that itself is enough to, you know, really uh, make them react in a negative yeah. manner. Uh, yeah. I mean, maybe I speak the same way. I don't know. So I don't know where to look. And then I wonder, okay, if I don't look at them, am I offending them further by ignoring them? So I'm, and then... Do I speak to them? Do I don't speak to them? Do I smile? I'm, I'm really lost and it made me feel really, really uncomfortable. And that is what I want all, everyone, all men to feel really, really uncomfortable because um, it's until you are put in that situation, you have, you have no idea what, uh, what it feels like. So that is what I felt like. And I'm like, and I have not had any abuse in my life. So I can only imagine what it must feel like for her. And everybody looking at her like that. Everybody who meets her not knowing where to look, not knowing whether to speak to her, whether to smile, whether to engage with her. Um, but it also depends on their, I mean, some girls are very strong and resilient. Most of the girls are strong and resilient. And when they come into the reintegration center, uh, very quickly, the environment that they are in, it changes them a lot. And I have seen that transformation over two, three months, the transformation from being this um, uh, closed up, uh, locked up introvert, uh, they open up a lot uh, and they're much more free in the way they express themselves uh, and they talk to us. And I really enjoy the time that I spend uh, with the girls. Um, and I hope that, uh, that, they, that 
by talking to them and being a part of their reintegration process that they feel that they are valued in society, that there, is, there are people out there who want them to do well and who want them back in their lives. Do they still have dreams for the future? Yes, they all have dreams. There's, there's a dream tree at the reintegration center where every batch that comes in, uh, they paint their dreams on papers and they stick it onto a tree. Uh, and their dreams are to be a doctor, to be an engineer, to be a lawyer, to be a nurse, to be a singer. Um, to and, I, and I even saw one dream to be a mother. I saw I saw one girl had the dream to be a mother. Had the dream to be a mother. There's uh, one girl who wanted to be a cricketer, uh, and it's 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 lovely to see all these dreams, and it's lovely to see that they still do dream, that their dreams have not been taken away from them, and uh, hopefully we can make those dreams come true. Uh, Jahan, uh, there's a question being raised through Facebook on uh, what, I mean, if you take this abuse and gender-based violence at the workplace, because mm. there's a lot of uh, such abuse taking at the workplace yep. as well. What can we, I mean, what can people really do about it? In your opinion, I think a lot of people prefer to stay silent about it. The, that way the victims further get victimized and the others just turn a blind eye. But what do you think needs to be done at a workplace level? Okay, I'm going to draw a bit of a parallel here um, because uh, my workplace, the work environment that I have been has no gender-based violence because we are all men, we have very gender-specific violence. Um, but the point, the, the parallel I'm going to draw is, is within a team. Uh, and this is uh, an opinion that I have of batsmen and bowlers. Cricket is a batsman's game. It's uh, designed for batsmen. The rules are written for batsmen in very much the same way that our society is a patriarchal society. So it's always the batsman who calls the shots in a cricket team. You have six, seven batsmen in a team, four bowlers, and oh, you always have this batsman and bowlers thing. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we are all playing for the same team. Whether you're a batsman, a bowler, a wicketkeeper, a spinner, or if you're just there to feel that uh, short leg, you're on the same team. And until that, until everyone realizes that, that team is not going to be successful. And that is the same parallel that I'm going to draw to uh, gender-based violence, where as long as we see men and women on opposite sides or on different teams or children or the aged population on a different team, we are not going to be successful. We're not going to work, go forward as a society. Uh, same for corporations as well. Um, as long as people don't see your counterpart, just because she's a woman, if you don't see her as a part of your team, uh, you're not going to respect her and uh, you're not going to work together. So that team culture is so, so important uh, in how people treat and respect uh, each other. And that's the First thing that uh, it's of, of course a lot harder to do at a corporate level because the numbers are so big. Uh, but I think that's a personal culture that you can bring in. If you create that work environment, anyone who comes into that culture will automatically conform to it. Jehan, I want to ask about this situation where once a girl has been in the reintegration center and when she returns back home. So they go through a process. Uh, I believe they are subjected to certain education like English and self-defense, IT. The, the basic skills are given because when during the time that they are in the witness protection uh, shelters, they don't have a proper structured education program. Once these girls return back home, uh, what's, the, what's the kind, what's the reception they actually get? I believe there have been some classic cases where the girl return, returns home tomorrow, I mean, let's say today, and tomorrow sometimes you get you have the, the drunk father who is trying to abuse her. That has happened. Um, as soon as they go back home, uh, you, you do get calls uh, uh, with people looking out for retribution. Uh, but again, so that's again part of the system. I there is a system, Tarindu, and the system can work. We just need more people, more resources thrown into it. 
we need to spend more money on it we need to spend more money um on training people uh, for them to be more aware of it and once the girls do leave the shelters or the reintegration center and mind you emerge works with only a small number of girls with reintegration the number of cases in sri lanka there are about 10000 cases um, which are sitting in the courts at the moment cases of abuse emerge works with about the uh, about 50 girls a year on reintegration and uh, there about 120 girls uh, within shelter so it's a very small number that uh, we can work with but the numbers are really really big so if you just need more people involved in more money in, uh, thrown into this more training more appreciation for all the people who are working in in these uh, child protection uh, areas and even once they leave but if they are released into a protective environment once they go back if the grama sevaka if the police in that local area are informed that you know this girl is coming back just keep an eye out for her. there was a a good program in uh, rwanda where they had an education program for the boys the young uh, teenage boys after school they used to stay back and they were given classes on um, women's rights uh, to show them that women are an important part of society that they have to look after their sisters so they actually became guardians of these young kids they are 16 17 18 year old kids they became guardians of the girls of that village so it's it can be replicated but is there any such hope. is there any such program in in sri lanka not that i am aware of not that i am aware of but it's something that can be very easily replicated we need that society people from that village uh, the young boys the young girls from that village uh, stepping up uh, the mothers stepping up and taking responsibility and uh, looking after those girls jehan do you think that this i mean this trend towards gender based violence and it there is i don't see a sign of it going down actually as you said it's only a very few cases that are getting reported do you have any numbers on this uh, in terms of how many cases are reported in sri lanka on an annual basis um <laughs> it's approximately one there it's no reporting is different so there's about a, one case of rape a day on average this is just a, on average one girl, young girl is raped every day um as a statistic but i'm sure the numbers are much higher these are only the reported cases and once that happens that case get gets pushed into uh, the court and there it gets held up for about 3 to 4 years so these cases keep piling up piling up piling up and the numbers are actually not going down they are actually increasing jan in my view uh, the point which i actually started raising earlier i believe that gender based violence is actually having its roots in gender based intimidation because on any given weekday if you are on the street and if you happen to notice a boy school bus and i'm saying this with any boy school bus right you tend to notice that they will pass the most crudest of remarks and indeed with sexual references uh, to any girl or bunch of girls standing out on the road and mind you while they are doing it there will always be a policeman not so far away a policeman will be there not so far away. in fact once i saw this happening they they were being extremely crude at uh, a girl who was on the road and when i asked and there's a police guy just watching that now you may imagine the situation you get a bus full of school boys about 100 of them passing the crudest of remarks at a girl who is in in my judgment she would have been maximum about 14 or 15 and the police guy uh, turning a blind eye and when i asked him i said why are you not talking to them his reaction was uh, for how many buses am i supposed to speak every bus is like this so what are your thoughts on that is there a serious problem in our education system there is a serious problem in how we approach it so the first question i ask i and i have to ask this is why didn't you say anything okay so that's very the point very point yeah so that's the point i'm going to come to see so in any uh, instance of abuse there will always be three parties the offender the victim and the bystander and often the, there'll be more than one bystander so the bystander is the one who can do something about it 
not the offender, not the victim. So, and we need to speak up without waiting for, and I'm as guilty as you, Tarindu. I've, I've been on those buses. I have been on those buses. Uh, and the thing is, until you know better, until you have a sister or a mother, or until this is told you, this is not in our curriculum. We do not know what abuse means. We do not know the definition of abuse, the definition of, definition of harassment. Um, if these, I really feel that that should be a part of our curriculum and uh, children are made more aware of how easy it is, open, it is to offend someone else, whether it's a girl or a boy uh, from a different gender, how easy it is to uh, offend someone else by passing a uh, crude comment. And the bystanders... And, and Jah Jahan, mind you, uh, now these kind of buses, you get the, the smallest of boys who are sitting and watching and at the same time, the most senior boys are doing it. So automatically, there is a message, in my view, there is a message being passed to the younger ones saying, look, this is what this is all. This is okay to do. You know, when you become our age or senior age, you could also do the same. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and they they follow suit. It's a it's a cultural thing, and we need to change that. And like the only way to reduce the numbers is by doing that at a grassroots level. For there to be a proper like a long term solution to this problem, that change has to be organic. We can put in whatever systems we want. You can put a thousand cops on the road. You can have the best court system in the world, but until the mindset of people change, uh, we are always going to have this uh, these cases of abuse and harassment. Jahan, where to from here now? For the public who is watching this, for our viewers who have joined us this evening, in your view, what what, what are the what are maybe the, at least the baby steps that they could actually take? Uh, how what can they do? And also, I would like to ask, if, how can these people join hands with Emerge because some people even don't know that this kind of a uh, support system exists. How, what, what, what's the next step? Um, just report. I mean, there are numbers 1932. You can call the NCP. If you see it, uh, instead you just call the cops, call 119. If you see something, uh, people call 119 for a lot less. They call 119 and say there's a car parked outside my house and they complain to the police. So, just call it out. If you see it, call it out. The problem is Colombo is small and often the offender is someone known to you. He's your best friend in school. He's your teammate. He works. He is going out with your sister, whatever. You know him. So you don't want to offend him. You don't want to upset the apple cart. And that has to change. We have to start calling people out, even if he's your best friend, especially if he's your best friend. If you see somebody, he's your best friend, then you owe it to him to go out there and tell him, dude, you did something wrong. I think you should apologize. And that will change. You do that once, it will change uh, everything. Okay. In terms of working together with Image, Jehan, how can the people actually, can they reach out to you? Can they reach out to Image? Uh, are there any annual programs? Do enlighten the viewers about it. Yeah. Uh, reach out to me any time more than uh, happy to uh, speak to any one of you. Um, with regards to annual program, so we run our reintegration in uh, two batches and we are always, I mean, we will work with as many girls as we can. So if you, anyone wants to come in, sponsor a girl, help her through her reintegration, um, even help them through the shelters once they're taken into protective custody, Help them with uh, legal aid, help them through their fight their court cases, help them get some sort of education while they're in the shelters, uh, therapy, counseling. There are so many aspects of this where even, and there is nothing too little, even if it's a matter of saying hello, sending the girl a card, there is nothing too little. It's just to make her feel wanted. So it, just reach out to us, uh, emergeglobal.org. Uh, is our website. Uh, reach out to us. We have our Facebook page, uh, Emerge Global. Uh, Emerge Global is the uh, founder company. Um, the interesting story about this, Tarindu, is that it was a young girl from the US who came down, uh, who came here, I assume, on holiday. She was 19. She was, she was going into Stanford, MIT, like, but she saw these girls in Sri Lanka and decided to stay back and work with them. And that has changed their lives. So instead of, I mean, 
she's done all her education, her studies, top scholar, but uh, chose to work with these girls. And it took someone from the US to come here and to show us a problem that we have and also hopefully show us a solution. Jan, in um, this kind of context, since you mentioned about the ability to sponsor a girl who is going to face, uh, going to be in the reintegration, uh, is there a particular pricing package that is involved or how does it work? So the reintegration approximately for one girl costs uh, about 300,000 rupees uh, for the cost of one girl for that uh, reintegration program. So that also is broken down into components. There is the self-defense classes, there's the IT classes. Um, and you can be free to, feel free to ship in any way you can. But um, 300,000 rupees, that we also do have packages for 50,000 rupees. You can sponsor a girl for one month uh, in the reintegration program. Or even you can, for 50,000 rupees, you can sponsor a girl's entire shelter program. Sorry? Uh, yeah. You can sponsor for, a girl. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, sorry, Jihan. Uh, just so in the shelter. In the shelters. In the, while they're in protective custody, uh, the programs that we run there, um, those actually cost us a little less because uh, we don't uh, house the girls. Uh, it's a government that uh, houses them. And so in the reintegration sponsor, center, it's your own center where these house. girls get to come and say and experience a real family life. Correct. That's right. So the costs are obviously higher with our reintegration um, rather than when we go into the state-run uh, shelters. But we are, I mean, our help is needed everywhere. And Jehan, in some of these shelters, some and it's not a cut and dry case of okay, the girl has faced abuse and she's now in the shelter. So, and in sometimes some of these girls are actually staying with their own children. So they, yes. are, they are maybe 14, 15, and they are carrying their own child. They, that is a difficult one. That's a really difficult one for me. Um, I have no idea how to, how they do that. So there are there's there are girls who are actually born in protective custody, and that's really really difficult. I mean, that girl has done no wrong. Uh, not that her mother has done any wrong either, but uh, she is born into this uh, protective custody, and you get little daycare centers within the protective custody as well. And it's really, really sweet to see uh, how these uh, systems can work. Really, they can work uh, if they have uh, the proper resources. Um, but yeah, Jan, how how I mean, are, are the laws strict enough? They always say that the the hands of the law are quite long and that no one is there, but is the, is the law really strict enough in your opinion? The law is strict enough. They just, the hands are long. They just need to grow some fingernails and just claw a little bit more. The law is there. It's just not uh, enforced. And I think, it, like I said, the laws can be there, but uh, the society needs to change. Um, and until that happens, we can write all the laws we want, but uh, we're not going to see a lasting change. There's an interesting comment from Rifka and one of our viewers this evening. Um, uh, and he has asked uh, something to do to, uh, uh, to the effect of what we have discussed earlier as well, uh, Jehan, about how we can help the security. And as you said, you know, report it. Maybe at least, as you said, give the confidence to a, a lady that you know who is going through this problem. Give, the, give them the confidence to say, hey, look, you know what? If you want to go and speak out about this, I, I will support you. But uh, he has, he's raising, raising a very interesting point. He's saying, in village level, uh, the police don't want women to reach the police directly. It was told by an OIC of a police station. He mentioned the police doesn't do gender sensitive. Uh, and yeah. there are abusers right. in the police department as well. So how, how to meet the legal provision through law, enforce, uh, law enforcement in our environment? I mean, it's a, it's a really uh, grave, uh, grave situation. I mean, I, in my view, I think after... I mean, in the evening hours and maybe even in the morning hours, ladies generally find, uh, unless you are a frequenter, uh, ladies generally find it very intimidating to even go to a police station because of maybe the language that they use. It could be, it could be the that whole atmosphere there. So in a situation like this, I can only imagine what it must be for a girl to really go to a police station and try to explain this. But what, I mean, have you, have you heard of such cases as, I mean, earlier as well, where the police is refusing to write down a particular complaint? 
which is why there should always be a female police officer which is why there should be a desk for uh, women and children all the time at any police station so that uh, the women and children and that there is a female police officer to take down that complaint uh, which is not the case and if it is i think uh, i think things would be uh, very different so uh, the law is there and I, that's a very valid point and also like the, i saw the comment the question on the harassment on buses uh, again that's uh, difficult to address but one thing we can do is if people are okay with it fix a camera on the bus install a camera if the buses like you have with with uber now uber have had to have upgrade their security policies to have more security in because of uh, instances of abuse with uh, uh, kosha uh, uh, ride sharing uh, cars if buses can come out and you have this bus that says look we are safe for women we have monitoring systems and we will report if we do find something if we have a, a a driver and a conductor who are trained and say look we are not going to let this allow this happen on the bus women will feel a lot more safer to travel uh, in those buses well valid points jahan any last thoughts uh, thank you very much you have joined us uh, for the time of almost 1 hour in these last 5 minutes any thoughts that you like to share I just wanted one that we are doing a fundraising because of all the because of the covid all our fundraisers have got cancelled for this year which is the same for most places and i know it's a difficult time to uh, go they asking for funds but uh, this is definitely a worthy cause something that i've thrown my full weight behind uh, there is an online uh, fundraising campaign on gofundme uh, for the emerge girls um if you do please share uh like spread the word about uh, emerge spread the word about child abuse spread the word about uh, gender based violence and please understand that we are on the same team whether you are a batsman or a bowler whether you are a man or a woman whether you are a boy or a girl young or old singhalese muslim tamil we are all on the same team and unless we start seeing it from that point of view we are not going to go forward jan mubarak thank you very much for joining us this evening we spoke about a topic that should be spoken about a lot more often but unfortunately i find it to be swept under the carpet most of the time yes some people are trying to raise the voice but it would be a good thing to see as you said for men for more men also to come up speak up and if you see somebody especially the men if you see another man who is doing this it may be your best friend that's as you said more of a reason to bring it up and to expo- and to correct him rather than encourage it or rather passively encourage it by staying actively silent which is unfortunately approach many take but is indeed not the right way thank you very much to all our viewers who joined us this evening both on zoom and also on our facebook live the video of this uh, discussion will be published within the next few days the full video on uh, my youtube channel as well as on facebook so do stay tuned for that and jahan mubarak thank you once again for joining us good luck uh, in your journey as a coach and also more so in your journey with image may you be able to give more inspiration uh, to more girls to stand uh, strong and stand independently despite the trauma they face and we are with you we will always support you on this journey and good luck and that's it for this week's uh, episode good night kalambo thank you excellent